stop teaching kids about skin colour privilege, critical race theory, gender ideology. How many genders are there? There are no genders. You're a male or a female. We have the controversial and cancelled actor turned politician, Lawrence Fox. You know, I'm a sort of classic example of someone who didn't have a, the orthodox acceptable view in show business, so therefore I'd be removed in a sort of Chinese-style suppression of free speech. The woke agenda is about ripping down what society is all about and dividing us. I'm going to say this isn't a racist country, and if you start calling me white privileged, I'm going to call you a racist, because that's what that is, not a racist. Speak up for what you believe in, lose your career. Keep your career, shut your mouth. Getting cancelled is very painful. And my jaw hit the floor when he exposed Bill Gates. I think that he's got some pretty controlling tones to him. There's something I really admire about the lack of ostentation about proper charity giving. So when someone makes a big show of it, I, I'm like, hmm. I love having these raw, honest, brutal and real conversations. Conversations that most people do not have the courage to have. If you would like us to have more conversations with great guests like this, make sure you like the channel, subscribe and turn the notification bell on. Lawrence, how do we reclaim the UK? Wow, uh, let's go in easy, shall we? Um, <laughs> no lube. How do we? <laughs> how do we reclaim the UK? Well, you've got to. St I suppose it's you've got to. The UK is kind of lost at the moment, so we've got to start at the beginning, which is education. I would say, stop teaching kids about skin colour privilege, critical race theory, um, gender ideology, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Start early in What's school. What's wrong with those? What's wrong with what? Yeah. Those stop. Did you say stop or start teaching them? Stop those? Yeah. teaching them. So what's wrong with those things? Well, you don't. Uh, kids don't notice skin colour and race. They're not interested in it. No. My my kids' mates are not are, are multi ethnic, and they don't ever talk about race until they're taught about it, and then they start talking about it. Uh, so I don't think that's good. Dividing people up into groups based on skin colour. Martin Luther King had some good things to say about that, didn't he? Mm. Um, then we've got uh, gender ideology, which is not good because again, kids are just not ready to deal with the whole idea of you may be a boy or a girl. It's like it's hard enough being a kid without going, you, you, you know, you can be a girl or you can be a boy. I don't think it's a good idea to teach kids. There are other things that kids could learn that would help them. So, you know, in the end of the day, you know, look, we had the Roald Dahl thing, didn't we, yesterday where you got the sensitivity readers or day four sensitivity readers taking out bits of books. But Roald Dahl wrote those books in order to give kids wicked imaginations. And wicked imaginations are important in children because they make great individuals. And we want individuals to stop this sort of mega group thing that we've got in the UK at the moment so that when so that it's you know they're able to reclaim it for us because at the end of the day we're our us lot are in trouble. How are we in trouble? What's wrong with the UK? Well, it, it feels very divided to me. You know, I'm a sort of classic example of someone who didn't have a, the orthodox acceptable view in show business, so therefore I'd be removed from show business. That's, you know, in a sort of Chinese style suppression of free speech. So um, I don't think that's a good idea. I think people, we got, we polled half the country are frightened to open their mouths. Democracy doesn't flourish without free speech. We've got a major free speech problem in our country. We hate ourselves. We're inward looking. You know, there are genuine threats around the world, certainly from places like China and that. And we're sat there rewriting Roald Dahl books. The, our society is sort of, it feels a bit end of daisy to me. Wokery feels like the affluence that we've all been afforded in this country. You know, uh, I was listening to an interview with a North Korean defector the other day, and she was saying that what they teach in American universities is very similar to what they teach in North Korean universities. You know, it's not, we don't need to teach this sort of collectivism group, group think that we've got nowadays, and this permanent offence when we live in such affluence. I've been thinking about this a lot, because mm. I think this is the worst I've seen in the UK since I've been alive, I'm 44 years old. Happy days, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think we've had it too easy too long. You know they say um, good times make weak people. Yeah, good times. And, I mean, imagine we were in World War Three. No mm. one would care about gender. We are no in one. World War Three. You think we are? All right, well, let's go there well, then. Aren't we? I mean, as far as I can tell, we are. He's not. How are we in World War Three? Because we're sabre rattling against Vladimir Putin with um, our you know, we're offering weapons, munitions and stuff like that into a, someone who's not part of NATO. I think we are sort of, I, I think Vladimir Putin's a really nasty bloke and I, I'm really happy to see the end of him, but 
I don't really want to, I don't understand why America is sabre rattling and Britain is sabre rattling with them. Um, with a guy with loads of nuclear weapons. Well, when you say you don't understand why, have a guess as to why you think we are. Um, well, I'm not. I can't go down all the conspiracy theory land uh, rabbit holes because I, you know, I think it is quite simply he wants to expand the Russian Empire and he sees Ukraine as part of it. And I think that we feel obligated as part of our historical desire to defend people's borders to do that for them. I'm just not convinced this is the fight you want to pick with them. Wow, so we're in World War Three. Well, we're, I, we're sort of we're in a, certainly in a cold war, aren't we? Again, I would say that at the moment, and it's in danger of becoming a hot war, especially if we start sending over tanks and jets and things like that. I mean, how long is it before you start putting feet on the ground? Yeah, yeah. Do, if the, if there's an atrocity, somehow. And I was upset about getting demonetized on a couple of YouTube videos this morning. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and now you're telling us, yeah. Well, I, it's it. I, I sort of look at it and I go, we are kind of, we, well, if we're not in it, we're on our way towards it, if we're not really, really careful. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like it's the closest we've been to World War Three that I've been alive. I mean, I've, at one point I thought maybe Trump's going to cause it. And he was elite, but Trump, Trump understood deterrence. So, yeah. so he was invaluable in that concept. He knew the difference between deterrence and weakness. And how, when you, how can you explain that? Well, deterrence is going, he was unpredictable, wasn't he? So with Kim Jong-un, he started calling him a little rocket man and saying, my rocket's bigger than yours. Like, if I was Kim Jong-un, I'd be sat there going, who is this nutcase? And I would have thought, maybe he's, he's good to his word. I would have been frightened of Trump, you see, if I was the North Koreans. I wouldn't be frightened of Joe Biden at all. He's got no deterrence. He's far too busy talking about racist highways and, you know, gender affirming care for uh, chopping off kids' genitals. It's like, no, mate. You know, and he's, all, he's on his way. He's in Ukraine yesterday. Is he in um, East Palestine? Has he been yet to turn up? to watch the biggest natural disaster going on about all the climate all the time, going and helping out all of those 80% Trump voting people who live, poor Americans who live in East Palestine? No, he's not. You know, that's, he's sabre rattling. So how did we get here then? How did the UK get here? Well, we don't have a cultural uh, border force, do we? So we, you know, you, what you need is a, you need some way of stopping bad cultural ideas coming into the country. And we just haven't managed to do it. But I think you're, uh, hard times create strong men thing is um, is is valuable. We've been affluent. It's for been too easy, hasn't it? I think our really? low interest rates have been for so long, so there's free money. <laughs> we've had fairly good times. We've never had to really fight. Yeah, but then what happens when you get, have low interest rates and you print a, mm. a load of money? Well, yeah. That then and then you start money raising becomes worthless. Then you start raising interest rates. Yeah. Then what do you do? You, yeah. You're killing everybody. Yeah. And also we're celebrating virtue and false, you know, false virtue ahead of real courage. You know what I mean? It's not. We're not. You know, Sadiq Khan is going. I'll give you all. All the kids can have a free dinner, but he's charging everybody else a ton of money, uh, taxation in the name of salvation for stuff like you, Les. So everyone's like, oh, brilliant, Sadiq, you're so thoughtful and caring for the kids. But what he doesn't do is go to the millions of families that he's just made it impossible when they've got no money anyway to travel around, even get their kids to school in a lot of cases without spending the mm. load of money that you is. Mm. So is this <coughs> because we have a out of date at best or corrupt at worst political system? Yeah, we, got, we don't have a political system because every party is the same. Yeah, they, essentially. So you've got yeah. People talk about capitalism and they criticise capitalists. Where is a capitalist system? I don't see one. No. Well, look, where's the oppositional adversarial political system? You know, even yeah. even if Labour disagreed with lockdown, uh, Labour totally agreed with lockdowns and all the madness that went around that mass formation, they should have objected. That's the point of the opposition. Mm. It wasn't a time of war. It was a nasty bug. You, someone somewhere should have been in opposition to that. So we've got, we've got Tories who are high a high-tax, low-growth party who can't control immigration, which is essentially what their sort of job is, and to conserve and preserve our culture. That's their job, isn't it? That's what it says on the tin with Conservatives. They don't do that anymore. No. They're into net zero. They're not into building local businesses. They're not into, I mean, they call it levelling up. That, to me, sounds like socialism, dragging down rather than going levelling up. And then you've got Labour, who actually now have, have jumped slightly right of the Tories. So they're just, they're just slightly less socialist than the Tories. I mean, I'm starting to think Labour are more impressive, a lot more impressive than the Tories, and that's a worry. Yeah, I always used to be scared of Labour being into power, thinking that they were going to 
ruin it for businesses and entrepreneurs and the, the taxes would be penal, but I don't know that they can get any more penal. But it's evil, isn't it? It's yeah. like, and, and where is the, so the, the system is broken. I mean, look, we've, we've spent, we've been in existence, the Reclaim Party has been in existence since oh, God knows when. When did it start? Three years ago, two years ago? For that period of time, we have been trying to get a bank account that people can donate to so we can have membership, so we can grow. We can't get it. You can't get a bank account. We're just about to get a bank account. Fingers crossed. But Why we, do you think that but is? But we reckon they'll do us at the last minute. on um, Because they don't want little parties. They don't want insurgent parties. Because they know that there's a big groundswell of people. I mean, I was in Oxford on the weekend protesting against LTNs and 15-minute cities and stuff like this. And there were seven, must have been five, 7,000 people there. You know, so there's a huge constituency for people that are just want to do some common sense stuff and aren't interested in power and control over other people, which is what we're in at the moment. I went on the question time and I thought, I'm going to say it. This isn't a racist country. I said, I'm not going to apologise for it either. And what actual damage has it done? Well, the next day, Equity, the Actors' Union, called for me to be denounced. But basically, there, it was a call to arms to the showbiz community in England for me to be done. And why did you s start the party, the Reclaim Party? Because I'm, I'm sick of hating this country, people hating this country and focusing on things that my grandparents, grandparents, grandparents did, or, or in you know, other people's cases, their grandparents, grandparents, grandparents did. It's not about the past. Of course you need to, you have history lessons to teach about history, but you don't, history lessons aren't to slap and berate yourself and tear down statues and rename streets. This, that's our cultural heritage you're messing around with, mate. I don't, you know, and, and in Roald Dahl's case, rewriting books. It's like, no. I, you don't, history is there to be learnt from, it's not to be eradicated. It, you know, George Orwell, as they keep saying on social media, it's not, it wasn't a manual 1984, but it feels like it is at the moment. Mm. So that's why I started it, to reclaim things. You know, also when you go into a, a, a yard, a, you know, what they, you know, the salvage yard, mm. you go into there and you see those huge long stretches of pine that they've got leaned up against the wall. You can reclaim them and turn them into a floor at a vast, well now they're quite expensive, but <laughs> a lot less than you could have someone come in and do it. It's nice to reuse things and mm. to learn from our, from our cultural heritage rather than just wipe it out because it's a bit uncomfortable. So what would your, let's try and turn it into a positive here. Mm. Um, what would your vision for a united kingdom be or a great Britain? Okay, that's a good question. What would my vision for, well, it has to start with the primacy of free expression. So people, that people have to be encouraged to debate and to be allowed to express their views. We can't have a mononarrative where everything is suppressed. I would have a, a broad media for example, that covered all aspects of the political spectrum. I would take the emphasis away from skin colour and what divides us and put the emphasis on what's inside that unites us, which is a common humanity. All of us, we, we ha all have joys and we all have struggles in life. And that's where I begin, with the individual. So how does the individual make their life a happier and better place? And how can they support their community that they live in and take pride in the community they live in? You know, instead of Londoners sitting there, uh, s you know, scoffing at Northerners, you turn around and go, these are just different people who live in different places. And, and, you know, get rid of all of this diversity, equity and inclusion because equity is, is anti-British and it's also anti-capitalism. You can't have a meritocratic country where, you know, one person's good at this and one person's good at that with a diversity um, agenda. It just doesn't work because diversity, equity and inclusion is about dragging people down to the lowest common denominator. And merit meritocracy is about lifting people up who are talented at various things. You know, it's like quotas. They did it with... Um, the Brits, didn't they? They, did, they got rid of female and male and then all the nominees were male. So then they thought, oh, we'll have to bring in a quota for females. It's like, it doesn't work. It's not, it's a, it's, it, it's the woke agenda is, uh, is about ripping down what society is all about rather than, and dividing us all into like, our intersectional grievance areas. It's not about bringing us together. So first and foremost, you've got to know what it is that Britain stands for. And Britain stands for common law, equality under the law, free speech, and you know these sort of simple common sense values, and we should be celebrating those, not um, on them. So that to me sounds like 
common sense. Oh, and oh, 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 careful with that one. <laughs> you might need another cigarette. That's racism. <laughs> common sense is now racist, I think. Really? I think most things are racist. What isn't racist nowadays is what we've got to ask ourselves. I mean, can you think of something that isn't racist? Or I, well, let's see if we can think of something that we couldn't find racism in everything. That's the question. Everything's racist. Common sense is racist. Maths is racist. Everything's racist. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I can't. I'm, I'm going through some things in my head. I was thinking fashion, but... That's racist. Yeah. And it's also fattest. Yeah. As well. Yeah. It's massively racist because, you know, look, look at the appalling crimes in fashion back in the 90s where it was just hot, skinny white women. I mean, where was the... Where was that's just racist, isn't it? Yeah, it's appalling. Yeah. Thankfully, we've redressed that. Yeah, what that's I love about podcasting, <laughs> 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 what I love about podcasting is it's the hardest place to get cancelled. Mm. Like, it's easy to get can We We recently have had some issues with demonetization on YouTube. Why is we, that? Well, we're just trying to find out because they don't give you the yeah. full explanation, and we have these periods of doing well on YouTube and then getting a little slap. But podcasts almost like this underground world where it's really hard to get cancelled or demonetized or anything because it's just something that's yours. Mm. I mean, they tried it with Joe Rogan and they, could, they couldn't bring him down. He got two million extra subscribers, didn't he? There you week? go, yeah. So maybe podcasting's a place where, right, you know, hardcore podcasting, maybe that's a place where there's no racism. Well, it's, yeah, exactly. It's definitely, that's a good one. Actually, well, actually, it's not a place where there's no racism. There's a place where there's ultimate free speech. And when you've got a lot of free speech, you have less racism. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because it, it just works out that way. But Why does it work out that way? I think because people, most people understand that we're all, you know, we all have good sides and bad sides to us. And the best way to explore the good sides and bad sides and go through arguments and, and learn from each other is by being very open in your discussion with people. But if you keep your discussion down and you suppress what you say, you become more resentful. Mm -hmm. And when people become more resentful, they become more extreme. I think that's mm. what happens. Yeah. I certainly, like, I was having a wind up with uh, Dr. Shola yesterday when she was going, look at all these um, white people winning awards at the BAFTAs, it's so disgustingly white. And I... Is that not racism? I went back to, well, yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Weirdly, they yeah. are the exact thing they accuse you of. Yeah, yes. And so I sent a picture back to her of the African Movie Awards. And I said, thanks very much for raising this important issue because there's absolutely no diversity here either. And she didn't like it very much. <laughs> Bless her. So. Some people have labelled you, mm. Lawrence, a right-wing conspiracy theorist. How does that make you feel? Um, I just don't care. Really, though? No. You really don't care? I used to care. Yeah. Um, I used to really care at the beginning, because getting cancelled is very painful. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Experience mm, to go mind. through. So I was very hurt, because you're going, this stuff is agony. You know, you're misrepresenting me entirely and deliberately. And... Um, you know, willingly uh, describing me in the wrong way. And it's not nice being, and then at the beginning, a few times after my cancellation, a couple of people did call me a racist, you know, and it was not, it was really unpleasant. But um, what am I, right wing conspiracy theorist? Um, so I'm not right wing, I'm commonsensical, I'm pretty liberal, actually. Uh, in line with a lot of the views of the country, certainly over stuff like trans issues, you know, I'm pretty liberal when it comes to that. I'm just not into chopping kids' dicks off, but you know, live your best life. That's good uh, to know. Li live, live your best life as an adult. Yeah. Um, so I would say I'm probably a liberal in a kind of Tom Stoppardy way, where you sort of nod to the right, which is what he kind of does. You know, that kind of intellectual curiosity and stuff that the right are very good, uh, used to be very good at. Mm. Um, conspiracy theorists, as far as I'm concerned, they've all been proved right thus far. So um, conspiracy factualist, probably. Mm. I would say, I'm, I'm yet to think of one of the conspiracy theories I've gone for that hasn't been proved right. And I, t I stay away from a lot of them. So I, t I try and stay away from Ukraine because I just think, what the do I know about mm. geopolitics in Ukraine? I can just look at it and go, 
So I try and stay away from things that I really don't know anything about and try and stay on the things that I do know stuff about. Mm. So what's a, one of the bigger theories you think you've been proven right with? Uh, the, the entire mass failed public health experiment uh, of the mm. lockdown policies and the vaccination so-called uh, rollout was the worst, biggest failed pu public health experiment in history. Uh, it's definitely now been proved to be true. As you see, our economy just destroyed because it's the, our currency has been diluted so terribly by Rishi's billion pounds a day of made up money. Uh, and then the, the, you know, the resulting cost of living crisis, which we've now got, which is going to disproportionately affect the poor, which is what I said from day one. And I ignored every single rule that the government came out with in terms of lockdowns, because mm. you can't tell me where I'm going to go or where I'm going to be ever, actually, ever. Uh, secondly, that England is a not is a, not a racist country, which it isn't. And under no metric is England or Britain ever not in the top five most tolerant, warm, welcoming countries on earth. People get in boats to come here. They wouldn't do that if we were an oppressive, vile, racist country. The, the woke mob is, is moral purity on steroids. Once you've started chopping people's heads off, in order to still exist as a movement, you need more necks and heads. I think mostly the woke mob begin in the upper middle class and they end up over, overreaching. Just a quick one, I have a digital financial toolkit for you that you can instantly download to make, manage and multiply money, build multiple streams of recurring income and increase your earnings. Now the link is in the description, it's completely free, it's my gift to you, so go and click the link in the description right now. I don't like Labour in lockdown. One, because it's in the past and two, because I don't want to get demonetised. Or, mm. And let me just clarify, demonetised, it's not about making money it's just about getting your content out there when they demonetize it they don't help push it out but i said within days of it happening this could be a 10-year depression i really felt like they're gonna have to spend probably nearly a trillion on this and they're shutting businesses down kids growth and development's going to be stunted um there's only one revenue source from this current government. There are more, but there's only one from this current government, and that is taxation. And I just felt like this is a 10-year depression coming. And, you know, some of my more loyal, long-standing followers probably thought I'd become a bit negative and conspiracy theorist myself. But I think it's really important to warn people. Plus 10% inflation for three years, and that's what they tell you. And nearly a trillion, let's be honest, um, on putting us through this lockdown and the very people who build an economy, the entrepreneurs and the employers, getting wiped out with tax and legislation. I have 150 staff and I have to have 15 people in one department, which is basically there so I can pay the government. Because it's not just paying your taxes, it's filling in your tax returns and dealing with all of the, the cost of that. I'm like, how can anyone in the UK start a business now without all this friction and penalty. Well, then when you start a business now, I mean, if you, it, okay, so edgy, edge of the seat conspiracy theory one. All right. Which I'm sort of, I, I you know, it's a cock up versus conspiracy debate that everybody has. It's, um, you know, and I, I'm a mostly cock up because I think that governments are just, you know, to show bits for ugly people, that's what it is. But um, I do, part of me thinks that some of those lockdown policies were a massive power grab from the, from the left, from the collectivists, to shut down small and medium-sized businesses. Why don't they just um, take a, well, when I say this, people get this wrong. So I've made a suggestion that you leave the um, upper working class and L lower millionaires alone. In fact, you give them loads of incentives. If you just take two to five percent more from the billionaires, the squillionaires, and the massive corporations. Now, when I say take two to five percent more, I don't actually mean take more because they're not taking the corp tax that they should be taking. But surely there's trillions there in the offing if they actually just collected the corp tax off the the billion zillionaires and the big corporations. Why but all they? these entrepreneurs in the UK, the spirit of enterprise in the UK, they're just going for them. Yeah, it's so anti-competitive. 
Well, that's the question you've got to ask yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you. Well, no, but <laughs> I, I am astonished at what Amazon pay in tax in this country. Yeah. I find it astonishing what Starbucks pay in this country. I think it's appalling. I don't think you should have offshore entities with that are. That I think if you operate in a country, you must have a taxable entity in that country. Yeah. I, I, how anyone got that passed a politician? Well, you know how they got it how? passed. A pol well, they're not all skin, are they? You know, at the end of the day, someone somewhere is getting something for that because you cannot have um, Amazon, the biggest business on earth. I think it is probably Apple or Amazon, mm. one of them, you know, top three. You, c you must have a taxable entity, something yeah. in the UK for every one of those mm. you know, overpriced AirPods that you lose every 10 <laughs> minutes. Do you know what I mean? Great business model. It's <laughs> so annoying. Yeah. Um, they, they absolutely, yeah. they that, should be. What, that's the outrage but it's the small entrepreneurs and business owners that are almost blamed yeah. well, and the, attacked. It's the Henry, it's Henry V, isn't it? You know, it's like you, you guys have had it hard, but you're going to have it even harder. And, but that's been ingrained through society forever that we put the massive weight on the engine room of this country, which is exactly as you say, those smaller entrepreneurs, people who are just trying to jump that one step up for the ladder only yeah. to provide for their family. And if they've got any spare time to volunteer in their community and do something good for the people around them. That is kind of the engine room of this country and it's crapped on by every single government in the world mm. with the hypocrisy that comes with it. So that, you know, you can't, by the way, you, if you live in Oxford, you can only go 100 times a year, otherwise you're gonna have to pay some money to, you know, 90% of people vote against this um, 50 minute city bollocks and they put it through anyway. It's 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 crapping on the on the the least well, well off in society who therefore are un, uh, who are completely unrepresented at the ballot box, you know unless it's somebody like Brexit when they go I'll be turning up for that vote mate don't you worry, um, that they, they've just completely shat on so it, it it's it does strike me that there is a sort of just an establishment elite class that just rolls along and goes don't worry mate you do, we, if you, you do your taxing in Luxembourg that's fine or do it in the Republic of Ireland or whenever. But you would, there should be a political party that goes, and certainly it should be the Conservative Party that goes, if you want to operate in the UK, you're going to pay tax. And then, but then someone in the government will turn around and go, yeah, but we don't want to lose Amazon. They're so important and they're so brilliant. And I'm like, you're not going to lose them. They're still going to want to sell their crap to us for, you know, and we're still going to want to have it delivered. Mm -hmm. We're just going to have to pay a bit more. What they'll end up doing, I, I imagine, is passing the tax burden on to us. So we'll have a delivery tax or an online order tax or something like that. And Amazon will still get it for free. Mm. And yet more money will be asked of the lower and, you know, the, the working man. Yeah. So, Lawrence, your CV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actor, musician, activist, politician, presenter. Um, but if you were to define your job description, what would it be? Well, at the moment, my job description is just being like a focal point for the frustrated, I think. I like that. A focal point for the frustrated. That's, that's quite that's good. That's a good one. I like it. Yeah. I just came up with that as well. <laughs> but more fag breaks required. <laughs> more fag breaks required. <laughs> what have I come up with now? Um, yeah, I think the thing is, look, I want to be an actor. I'm good at acting. Also, I, I, because I, I don't really like waste particularly, like I trained at the top drama school in England. I then did 20 years of working in front of a camera. So I'm a pretty useful person to have around because, you know, it's not like getting someone straight off the street to come in and knows how to hit a mark and all this sort of stuff. I know the business. Mm. So I'm sad about that. What are you sad about? Well, I'm just sad that I don't get to act anymore. You know, that was my job. Mm. That's what I spent 20 years doing. And so I, I didn't quit. I didn't quit it. Well, I kind of did in a way, I'm trying to work out, it's like a divorce, I'm trying to work out who left who, do you know what I mean? You get that sort of thing, yeah. or a relationship, it's can, hard. Can you tell us about that then? Because the, you said you got cancelled before, mm. um, and did you mean you got pushed out of the film industry, is that what you mean? Yeah, I did the question, I was on Question Time, and the, this woman, they were talking about Meghan and Harry, and uh, she was saying that Meghan and Harry had to leave the UK because everyone was really racist about Meghan, which they just weren't. She was just a bore off. And, you know, people find it irritating, especially if you've got a load of privilege like she's got and he's got, to moan about how oppressed you are, I think British people find irritating for all the reasons that we've gone through already, which is their lives are hard enough and they don't have a public platform to moan on. So I think they invited me on to go, oh, he's going to be the little liberal lefty actor who will turn around and go, um, 
Yes, no, I totally agree with you. It's all dreadful. But I've been harboring these views for a while because, um, A, I stopped watching television. It started driving me nuts and I couldn't deal with the mo mono narrative. And I sort of migrated over to YouTube and found people that I found much more interesting. And B, I thought, I'd sat on a set, my final job was White Lines, a Netflix thing. And I sat on a set with a very multi... A, when I got cast to do the job, I got offered the job in the room by the director who, who hired me for my first ever acting job 20 years before. So there was something quite magical about that. And he said, you've got the job. And I was playing like a Mancunian yoga drug dealer. And it was yoga teacher drug dealer. It was a great part. And I loved it. And he offered me the job in the room because I sort of was good at it. And um, then I waited a couple of weeks. No one had called me and said, here's what we're going to pay you and all that crap. Um, and I spoke to my agent and she went, there's a diversity problem. And I went, what does that mean? Never, never, literally never heard of it. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, there's a diversity problem because one of you's got to be back. So either you've got to be back or your missus has got to be back or the, you know, the, my other. And I was like, why? That's really bad. Because surely if you hire someone because of their skin colour, they're going to be walking on set going, I only got this job because I'm not white. I mean, I just thought it was a terrible, terrible idea. So I was immediately like, this is really wrong. There are amazing black actors who succeeded, and my favourite actor in the whole world is black in Denzel Washington, greatest mm. actor ever. And um, so I thought, this is a really bad way to go. And then when I sat on set, I used to sit, and bearing in mind, Netflix pay you quite a lot of money because you don't get any residuals from Netflix. Once you, it's, it's wham, bam, you're done. So they have to pay you pretty well. And I was aware of roughly what some of these kids were earning. And it was a lot. And I'm like, they're moaning about, you know, how oppressed they are. And I'm like, mate, you're on 20 mm. grand a week. That's not oppression. It really, really, really isn't oppression. So then, yeah, I went on the question time and I thought, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say this isn't a racist country. And if you start calling me white privileged, I'm going to call you a racist because that's what that is. Saying that I'm privileged by an immutable dint of my birth, that I have no say in. Yeah, I've got privilege by my birth, which comes from my dad, from which I also had no say in. But it's got mm. all to do with the colour of my skin. So I thought I'm going to say it, and then I did this deal with myself where I also said, once I decided I was going to talk about all of this stuff, I said I'm not going to apologise for it either, because I know that it's going to do some damage to my acting career. I just wasn't quite, <laughs> quite sure. <laughs> ready for the actual damage it had done. And what actual damage has it done? Well, the next day, Equity, the Actors' Union, um, should have worked that one out based around what its name is. Um, Equity, the Actors' Union, called for me to be denounced. Wow, what does denounced mean? Well, I mean, I just associate it with witch trials and, you know, and stocks and public humiliation, you know. But basically, there, it was a call to arms to the showbiz community in England for me to be done. You know, so I, it, by that point, I was like, I'm going to sue you unless you stop that. But, which is annoying, because if you believe in free speech, you don't really want to sue people. But you're like, mm. sake, you're all over me. And it just... It Did just you got, sue them? I threatened to sue them, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the damage is done. Yeah. The process is the punishment with this, the, with the diversity, equity and inclusion lot. They just put you through the hell, and then, you know, you, you've got to try and pick yourself up afterwards. So, um, yeah, they called me to be denounced and then I, um, you know, and then comes in the, cr the, the cracker they always come in with, which is you're a racist. Right. So you're just, and then once you're a racist, you're a racist, doesn't matter, does it? You know, that's it. You're just a racist. So I'm just like, okay, well, I'm not. So, and that was it. And then um, I had, uh, Sainsbury's did a... Uh, Sainsbury's did a campaign where they said they were going to create some safe spaces for their black employees during all of their madness that surrounded uh, George Floyd and all. Well, no, actually, I think it was pre-George Floyd. I think it was when, you know, when the woke virus was really on race. It had moved, I think it moved, just before it moved to trans, it was really, really on race. And they said, we're going to create some safe spaces for our black employees. And I went, what, are they in danger in Sainsbury's? Or, you know, m maybe you should give them some water fountains as well, you proto-segregationist. Mm. Um, which was responded to with, by a load of 
vir very virtuous social media users with you racist. So I just copy and pasted their tweets and just swapped the word racist for paedophile as a rhetorical device to go, um, you know, if you're going to throw a meaningless slur at me, then you can have a meaningless slur thrown back at you. So it's just, I'm, I'm, they hate the fact that I'm a posh white bloke has no problem talking about race. They find it, they don't know what to do with it because they expect me to own my privilege and, you know, be an ally. And I'm just like, no, this is divisive, horrible crap and I'm not playing your game. I'm not a racist and, no, and people in this country aren't racist. There are racist. The worst thing is by saying that everyone is racist, you're creating a really good environment for racists to thrive in. Mm. That's the major problem with it. So, um, yeah, I just won't play the game. So that sounds to me like that is a major quandary for you in your life. I mean, yeah. ma ma maybe you saw it or maybe you just sort of went through it. But basically, speak up for what you believe in, lose your career. Yeah. Keep your career, shut your mouth. Yeah. And it seems like more and more people now are being forced down that road. And you said, you know, when you suppress things, they come out in aggressive ways. I, I agree with that. Um, what is repressed, repressed must be expressed. So there's a hell of a lot of other people that probably are silencing themselves or cancelling themselves for fear of what happened to you. So if you were to go back, what would you do? Would you shut your mouth and keep your acting career going? Or would you do exactly the same thing again and speak your, speak your mind? I'd do the same again because, you know, the whole point of art is the whole point of art is to hold a mirror up to nature. You know, and also art should be massively countercultural. It shouldn't be mono it shouldn't it shouldn't align itself with the culture and spew out the same <laughs> that you're getting from the Times and the mirror and the you know, all of the newspapers and the government. You should it can't can't be like that. You've got to have a broad debate in life. So, you know, I always used to I, I mean I don't know what I'd feel like walking onto a film set. Because it'd be fine, the further away from the camera you are, the less woke people are. So as you walk past the chippies and the sparks and all that lot, they're all like, morning mate, how you doing? It's all fine, but by the time you get close to the camera, it's like, I really feel offended by um, your use of the word field as it's colonial, historical. You know, you're just like, oh God, do one. So I'm not sure how comfortable I would be going in front of an, a camera because, you know, it'd be like... Didn't you do a, a, a film yeah, but they recently, were all, though? they were all cancelled people. Right. It was <laughs> so that's your new CV vocation. Now, yeah, cancelled films. Yeah. Um, well, actually, weirdly, the Americans... Well, Gina Carano was cancelled properly, hardcore cancelled um, for, you know, being commonsensical. And uh, what's so weird, actually, these cancelled people tend to be the loveliest people you'll ever meet. Now, I would say that because of my own um, unconscious bias towards people that I like yeah. <laughs> who, who speak their minds. Yeah. But Darby, the director, Robert Darby, was, um, he hasn't been cancelled and he, he's got some pretty hardcore, he's, he's, a, he's MAGA, baby. Yeah. So you played Hunter Biden's son. Mm. Is that right? No, Joe Biden's son. Hunter Sorry. Biden. Yeah, yeah. Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's yeah, yeah. son. Yeah, yeah. 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 So tell us about that. That was, uh, it was fun. It was yeah. really good. I mean, you know, it, they're a crime family, so... Uh, How do you mean they're a crime family? Well, the Bidens are a crime family, you know. What does that mean? It means that they make, I mean, Joe Biden's been in the Senate for, what, 50 years or something like that? Uh, I, I don't know what they get paid as a senator, but it, it, it isn't as much money as he's got. So, but you know... But can he have other legitimate financial interests? He's definitely got legitimate financial interests, but he also very unlegitimate financial interests like, like via Hunter Biden. Well, all the stuff Hunter Biden did with in China and Ukraine as well, you know, that's, which is interesting. He bragged about it, Joe Biden, on TV. He said, you know, I, if, if they didn't replace the, the prosecutor on the Burisma case that I wouldn't give them whatever, however many billion quid it was. You know, they bragged about it, these people. They're, they're, it's interesting, actually, the Democratic Party in America, because it's like crime is fine. So I think they're sort of a criminal organisation in a lot of ways. I mean, the new Democratic Party, not necessarily the old one. But um, yeah, so it was fun to play the part. I liked it. The worst part was smoking fake crack and snorting fake cocaine because it clogs up like corn flour in your lungs. And I'm just getting my um, voice back a year later. Wow. And it's still bad, actually. If I have to speak in public or something like that, it's like, Ugh. and it's definitely obviously got nothing to do with the fags. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? So you didn't fancy coming out of your 
drug retirement and putting <laughs> some real stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't think I'm not into. Uh, I don't. I had, I had, I had my enjoyable uh, decadent youth, and uh, now I stick to uh, fags and a few gin and tonics. So, how do we get your acting career back on the line? Then, do you think there's going to emerge um, out of all of this some independence? Because it it feels like when everyone finally gets that we're being cancelled and trapped and there's this mono-dialogue and this globalist one-world order, out of that will come these pockets of independence, well, I hope. Well, nature abhors a vacuum, mm. doesn't it? So, um, yeah, you'd hope so. I think they will. I got someone phoned me up last night and said, I've written a script. I want, you know, I, I want to talk to you about it. They're often kind of rich individuals. I mean, Hunter Biden film was actually crowdfunded, but um, I think there'll probably be some rich people who are who will go. I want to put together a good old, good old movie. You know, that's that's you know, one of the classic stories mm. of. Um, you know, my favourite films in the whole world, maybe this again is part of my unconscious bias, is that is watching, is the opening shot is Bruce Willis asleep on the bed, drunk, and then uh, divorced, never sees his kids in a vest, wakes up, and he's got to save the world. <laughs> but those are the films that I like. Yeah. You know, are the against all odds films. I love them because they inspire you. You know, when we were, when I was younger, I remember going to cinema and leaving and walking down the road, feeling like I was a ten feet tall, and I, I was just like, this is amazing. I've been this film has filled me with joy. But now I watch films and I'm just like, oh god, when is this going to finish? And why is it so bad? You know, I've not even, I, I, I've not even. I saw All Quiet on the Western Front, which I thought was a very. I mean, it obviously had a very strong anti-war message, which is good. No one likes war. It's horrible. But it was beautifully crafted, and I admired the art of it. So that's about the last thing I saw other than Maverick, <laughs> which, um, you know, gave me the heebie-jeebies. Oh, you, d you disliked no, Maverick? No, I liked it. I, yeah. lo oh, I loved Maverick. Yeah. I just couldn't understand why the Americans didn't have fifth-generation fighters either. I, I was just really confused. I think, but it, so in a way, maybe Maverick was trying to go to America's on the decline as well, because we've only got the F-18s, we don't have the um, F-35s. Where were the F-35s in Maverick? That's yeah. what I want to know. No one explains that to you, do they? No, they don't. No. So you think the film industry is going through a tough time, do you? Well, it is going through a tough time. You know, it's, um, it, it is going through a tough time. Look at, look at viewing figures for BAFTA, look at viewing figures for the Oscars. I think people just, maybe again, it's that I've moved out of that world, so I don't kind of operate in it but I think people just generally look at it with a faint disregard and they just go oh there they are again awarding each other awards I mean the last time it was vaguely interesting was when Ricky Gervais gave his retirement speech at the uh, Golden Globes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know which was unbelievably brilliant piece of telly but he yeah. You know, he's managed to really, I suppose he's uncancellable, Ricky, isn't he? Because he's so... Well, I was just going to ask you, why is it that some people can go to those extremes and not get cancelled and other people do get cancelled? Cash. As in he has more cash? Yeah, I mean, you've got a load of cash. You're not, you can't get cancelled, can you? I mean, the point, of ca the point of cancelling somebody is to remove their right to a earn a livelihood. That's why it's so nasty. Yeah. So, you know, when I got cancelled, I had two kids to provide for, right? And... I went from earning lots of money to earning zero money. So that affected everything. So it affects your ability to buy a house because you go, you know, when you try and buy a house, you've got to provide them with three years worth of earnings, don't you, to go, this Ooh. is what I earned. And I had a period of earning zero, which I'm actually just coming out of now. So I could probably only just buy a house now unless I paid for it, for it in cash, mm. which they took away when they took away my acting career. Wow. Yeah. So Joe Rogan. Um, Etc. Ricky Gervais have got enough cash to burn through it. Well, I think it doesn't. It's not. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, and I'm not. I'm not denigrating their courage either mm. to do it. I'm just saying that they've got. Ricky their Gervais did a whole s set on it, didn't he? Yeah. Well, he's got enough. Ri but I don't think Ricky Gervais says what Ricky Gervais says for money. I think his. I think money is the accidental yeah. of his t great talent. Ultimately, so he's a proper artist. Then. He's a proper artist, and also he's willing to say what he thinks, and he's not going to, you know, kowtow to whatever the current crappy orthodoxy is that needs to be challenged and broken down every time, all the time, constantly throughout life. That's it's called progressivism, but that word has been co-opted as well.
What do you mean by that? Well, we're a progressive society, right? So in the 1980s, if you ask people what they, whether they thought gay sex was, or gay marriage or gay relationships were a good thing, 75% of people said it's wrong. That was in the 80s. And nowadays, 75% of people say it's right. It's called progressivism. Mm. It's good. Mm. We, we should progress. We shouldn't discriminate against people because of their sexual orientation. But you'd have thought, according to the woke mob, that we've become more intolerant over that period of time, but we haven't. We're mm. a very genuinely progressive society. They've, they just want to hyper, they want to be hyper regressive in the name of progressivism, which is why that they re, uh, you know, do the meaning of words, why words have to swap, stop meaning stuff. Yeah. You can't just have justice, it's got to be social justice. You can't, you can't have uh, not racist, it's got to be anti-racist. It's all, it's all very, it's, it's hard to grasp. The language has stopped meaning what it should mean. Mm -hmm. And language is crucial because you don't have good language. You're, mm -hmm. and I know I swear a lot, and I, but you are, it's mm -hmm. really bad. You're, mm -hmm. You can't express yourself to someone without going, which word am I allowed to use? Communication breaks down. Yeah frustration builds and then you get this this sort of turbulent stuff mm. and also people are looking to be upset because we're so affluent they're going like well you know Martin Luther King did a great thing in the 60s and you spat out and beaten as they crossed the bridge in Selma you know I want an activist cause to to do so what can we go for now well we've done homo homosexuality we've done race okay let's reinvigorate race and then let's go for chopping dicks off boys and girls chopping dicks off young people Social justice, man. Let's get out there. Let's affirm these children. You know, it's mm. we, we, we're too affluent and leisurely, as they say in America. We might be witnessing the end of the, uh, the you know, I said it the other day, I think we have already had the Great Reset. I think we've had a cultural Great Reset where we've all gone back to the beginning. And we've got to build the whole thing up again. Mm. Hence what I was saying about schools. So I'll come back to that in a minute. I would love to ask you, who is this woke mob? Who's controlling this woke mob? And what is the agenda of this woke mob? Because I don't understand it. Yeah, I think it's very difficult to understand, um, but like all mass movements. So I suppose a good, a good comparison is the French Revolution, isn't it? It started off by just chopping off one or two people's heads because, you know, they were... Mm and Marie Antoinette going, letting them eat bread, you know, while people are starving. But once you've started chopping people's heads off, in order to still exist as a movement, you need more necks and heads. So then you got the terror, didn't you? And all of this stuff comes out of the upper middle class anyway. I think mostly the woke mob begin in the upper middle class, the, the highly affluent, who sit there and go, how can we make the world a fairer place? And they start off with good intentions, and they end up over overreaching, as all of these movements do. Um, so, what was your? So, who is the woke mob? What, ask me. So, who is the woke mob? Who's behind it? And who's, what are their, what's their agenda? Well, uh, you know, you've got to steel man their argument, don't you? So, of course, there are things that we we need to be kinder to people, and we need to improve the world, and we need to, you know, of course, there is that that thing but the, the woke mob is is moral purity on steroids so you know and the only way you can really make everyone equal is the equity agenda which is to drag everybody down to one anti-meritocratic equity system where we're, where we're all essentially good little comrades and who's behind it I would say is part we're partly to blame who's we uh, the, the entire of our culture for not yeah. speaking up, and then uh, I would say that you know I, I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, the what what Yuri Bezmenov said, and or what um, in terms of the huge investment China makes in our social media, in our universities, and you know all of these sorts of things. America's certainly infected. They've got well, they've got four hundred thousand Chinese students in America. China's got a, the got the most up to date nuclear weapons in the world because they just nicked it off the Americans. So I think there is a, we did some polling the other day, there is 50% of the younger generation who are just having their first kids now want socialism in this country. So it's kind of, it's a major concern. It's a sort of, cir it's a circle that gets out of control like chopping people's heads off in the French Revolution. Jacobin rebellions, you know, you've got to, once a movement starts, it has to fuel itself. 
So, you know, you and it ends up then, like Winston Churchill said, feeding the alligator will always eat you last. Look mm. at Stephen Fry. You know, look, it's taking some of its great spokesmen and, and them. Spokes them, isn't it? <laughs> it's just doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard. I mean, I think you could spend your entire life trying to work out why things happen. Yeah. You know, and not really know. But this is a this is a cultural phase, yeah. and it and it will pass. A cycle. Because, and it's predictable. So the gr great reason is it. The great uh, hope of it all is it will ultimately mm. because it's predictable and it will overreach, and and people will just go. I've had enough. Mm. Which happened with Sturgeon in Scotland. Mm. They just went. You know what? You're not going to put a rapist in a female prison just because he's lobbed a wig on. People just go, that's enough. Yeah. So all you have to do is just go, that's enough. And she lost a job, eight years of it. I mean, I know there's the financial stuff and all, all the other crap that goes with that. But I would say that the, that trans ridiculousness of her self-ID in the prison thing just went, no, nah, mm. can't put up with that anymore. That's mm. insane. Why, why would you lock up a rapist in a room, room full of women? Mm you know yeah bad idea mm. on a common sense grounds mm. so even for your average person who wants to just like keep their head down and go mm. need to keep my job don't say it don't say it don't say all people are equal don't say england's a good place nod along when they say it's dreadful you know mm. i think they just sort of went nah so hopefully with that would that was a good belly punch back against them mm. lawrence yeah um Bill Gates at the moment seems to be one of the most divisive men in humanity. And as an entrepreneur for 17 years, I studied a lot of his entrepreneurial journey and got a lot out of it. And I thought when he became a billionaire and then a philanthropist and gave so many billions back, I thought it must be a net positive for humanity, Bill Gates. And then all these people started saying he's behind the virus, population control, and so many people seem to think he's the Antichrist. What are your thoughts on Bill Gates? I think that when you have, I don't like the fact that our politicians seem to want to be photographed with him all the time, going, we're going to, be, we're going to partner with Bill Gates. Why? Why are we represent, re representing the interests of Bill Gates? You're elected to represent the interests of the people of your country. So get him out of the way. Um, I think that he's a, He's got some pretty controlling tones to him. Certainly, in like, there's going to be more vaccines. We can make more of them. And it's like, I don't want any more of them, thanks very much. I didn't need this one, and I don't want any of the others either, thanks very much. I don't like the thought of a man who's he's twiddling his thumbs going, I'm worth billions of dollars. Now what can I do to improve mankind? You know, that's the stuff of bomb villains, isn't it? And um, it's like... Again, I don't want, I don't think people are naturally good. And all of the great horrors that have come to mankind have been done in the name of altruism. Every single one has been done in the name of doing the best for mankind. So when someone turns up saying, I want to do the best for mankind, and it doesn't involve getting out of the way, I'm worried. I find him a, uh, uh, you know, and also, you know, get vaccinated. It's really good for your health. It's like, do some sit-ups, chap. Go on a jog, maybe, or even a or even a brisk stroll, Bill. That might work for you. You moved. To <laughs> <laughs> don't hold back, or <laughs> I don't. I, I, but what I, about all these billions he's given to charities? This philanthropy, you don't buy it. No, of course it's great. Good for him. Give your billions to charity. That great. Thank you. But you know, look, uh, what's his face? Um, Sadio Mane gave all of his. He's given everyone in his village in. Senegal, seventy dollars. Is it Sadio Mane? No, yeah. it's not. Is it Mane? I yeah. think Mane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, He's yeah. Done loads. And yeah. there are a lot of footballers who um, actually, you know, who never talk about it or anything like that. Who give huge chunks of their salaries to their local communities, and it's, it's just they're just not spoken about. They just get on and do it. And I think you know, there's something I really admire about the lack of ostentation about proper charity giving. So when someone makes a big show of it, I, I'm like, hmm. I, if, if you put, I apply most rules in life, I apply the gun to head rule. And it's like, if you put a gun to my head and went, Bill Gates, yes, no, I'd have to go, no. That's it. And, yeah. I, and I probably couldn't ever get to the bottom of why. But, um, you know, I, I could make a good start with this uh, horrible collaboration between um, his, the climate 
crisis, uh, the desire to vaccinate the hell out of everybody and um, technocrats, I think, is, uh, is a pretty lethal combination. Mm. So if, from what you said, most all evils in the world have come under the guise of altruism, how do we be altruistic then? How do we be altruistic? Yeah, if, if all greed is under the guise of altruism, how, how, do we, how do we maintain altruism? What is altruism? Well, it's, be aware that you're, it's not altruism, it's service. You know, it's, that's what it is. And be aware that we're all pretty nasty. And when you think you might be doing something for a good reason, you might actually be doing it for a bad one. I ask myself this on a daily basis. Are you, you know, are we the bad guys hands? You know, mm. that meme. Like, you've got to ask yourself on a daily basis, am I doing this for the right reason? Is this, is this to try and bring people together? Is, it, is this to divide people? If it's to divide people, is it for the right reasons? Do people need dividing or disrupting in this? You ask that to yourself every day? Every day when I wake up, yeah. And is that not tiring? No, because it's important. It's self-auditing. Mm. Oh my God, I'm a Scientologist. Um, it's, you're auditing your own what you're trying to do, what you're trying to yeah. achieve. But I'm because I've got to have a faith, I also am going, I'm not just trying to do it for myself, I'm trying to I'm trying to represent something else. Yeah. Something no one really seems to talk about is um balance. Because if you think about it, um there is a selfish and a selfless angle to everything if you look at it. Yeah. So why can't we just all admit that there's a selfish angle to the selfless? Or if we are in the pursuit of something selfish, do something selfless to balance it out. Because is that not fair exchange? Is that not what we're after, fair exchange? Well, human beings aren't capable of that level of um, rationale. To, so you, to do that, you have to have an, out, uh, an outside figure of perfection or ideal. You, know, you, you can't do it by yourself. It's like, it's like you know, there's a reason why it says in the Bible, love your enemies. Because you I mean, that's your entire life you could spend thinking about that. Love your enemies. What do you mean, love my enemies? How do I do, what? How do I do that? It's like, you know, these huge conundrums that we're confronted with are the most important questions. I don't think we, I don't think we have the power to be, I think we always lean greedy. I think everyone will always lean greedy, mm. pretty much. And, you know, that's why you've got to ask yourself every day, am I leaning greedy? So Andrew Tate, who's been on my show just before he was detained, mm. imprisoned, detained, um, calls this the matrix. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a good analogy. I mean, uh, I, the little, I'd watched Matrix several times, and I love it as a movie. Apparently the matrix was originally about transgenderism. Ah. I've, I've heard. Is that, is it, Both is the it creators, the directors, sir? Yeah, yeah, I think it was brothers. a, are they brothers? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know enough We're about trying to get them on the show, aren't we? Wachowskis. Yeah. yeah. And but have they not changed they, their gender? They have now changed into women, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I'm so the creators of The Matrix have changed into women, according to <laughs> my producer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, yeah, it is a matrix, because once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I know you don't well, particularly want to go into lockdowns and stuff like that. But so you t say whatever you want. But once, once you you see how easy it is for the social fabric just to be like that. You go, wow, society as a whole is incredibly fragile and has been built very carefully by many, many talented, very intelligent, very altruistic and uh, greedy, evil people. But it's been forged time after time to, to be this thing, but it's very, very fragile. And once you get a sort of a lockdown or a cancellation or something like that, something jerks you out of it, you can't unsee how society is controlled. And that is terrifying. So I now, for example, don't trust the science. I don't. I wouldn't go into hospital by myself. And if someone said, uh, do you want your kid to have a flu, nasal flu booster? I'm like, no thanks. I have no idea what's in it. No thanks. And I imagine, a load of people will give kids non will stop giving their kids sterilizing vaccines now because they've just gone what's happened and we've got excess deaths like no one talks about them media doesn't talk about them so you've got to sort of sit there and go there's something going on here there's not it's not just it's it, it 
you know, it is. It's society is a social construct, isn't it? Mm. The whole thing is a social Money is a social construct. Rishi Sunak proved it by creating a million, billion pounds of it a day mm. out of nowhere. Where did that come from? Where, what's, it, what's it supported by? Nothing. You know? Yeah, there what is no gold standard. It's yeah. supported by nothing. Yeah, so, uh, so people are, but people are still dutifully, and I completely understand why they want to, you know, and Cypher, he can't cope. He just wants to go back into the matrix. That's what he wants, and he wants that steak, and he just wants to go, I know this isn't real, but fuck, it tastes good. Mm. So I can understand why people want to stay in the matrix, but I think it's a good analogy, yeah. Mm. So I've been thinking about this since lockdown, how to maintain my independent free mind, my, I suppose, independent integrity, and importantly, which I try and talk about a lot, but a lot of people don't, is financial independence. Because 10 years ago when I was teaching financial independence, it was basically build assets, produce recurring income, get your bills covered, have some ongoing residual money, go do what you want. And it seemed so simple back then. And now it's financial independence is not just about having enough money to live from assets. It's about so that they can't shut your banks down, cancel you and suffocate all of your earning streams. So... Um, are we at a time where we need to invest more thought, knowledge and discussion into things like Bitcoin because it's independent, being as decentralised as you can on social media, so if YouTube cancel you, you've still got Rumble and Getter and all these other channels, and really understanding how the monetary system works so you can maybe create your own monetary system or be independent of the monetary system. Yeah, I, think I know that was the worst worded question ever. No, but I know what you're getting at. It's, um, I think what it's going to do, I think it's way too late, by the way, on the money stuff. Too uh, late for what? To, for, for, for us to do anything but claw back the tiniest amount of black market independence that is available. The minute that phone was invented, the minute the smartphone was invented, you are, you know, you are GPS tracked. You are... QR you probably coded. listened to. Though I know I'm listened to because we all know we're listened to. You know, when do you start getting thrown up ads for stuff that yeah. you've been talking to about someone? And I, I imagine I'm probably listened to for other reasons as well. <laughs> yeah. But um, so yeah, once that was invented and it's now been co-opted into, you know, we are becoming cyborgs, aren't we? With mm. the phone, you know, we 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 pretty much live a lot of our lives virtually anyway. I don't know about Bitcoin, so I don't understand about it. That my mates who are massively into it, who will give me the Bitcoin lecture about the distributed ledger and all of this and the blockchain and all this. I'm sat there and I'm going, I don't understand. <laughs> so I still don't get it. Yeah. Um, I think what we'll have but is... A fi it's basically a financial system that's not controlled by a central bank. Surely that's not a good thing. That's a great thing. Yeah. So I think there'll be lots of them. So we'll, but I think what we'll do is there'll be bits when you're going to be using the central bank digital currency. So like when you engage with the NHS. Or Does that not scare you, a central bank digital currency? It terrifies me. Yeah. I think it's the world's, I think it's the most... It's and they the just most have a button to stop your source of income. Yeah, and stopping you transact to stop yeah. your move. Well, they're going to have a button on, I mean, which country is it now that's just installed that kill switches in every car that you buy? I can't remember which one it is, I think it's either America or Sweden. But every new car created now, the government can just turn you off. So, I mean, on one level, it's a good idea if you're in a police chase and uh, you want to stop the stop it all going mental. But on another level, it's like, it's my fucking car, mate. You know, it's like, why don't, why, why don't we, when they do the prick test on a kid's foot when they're born, why don't we just give the whole government everyone's DNA? And so we'll never have a single crime in the world. There is some form of personal autonomy that you have, a barrier between you and the government. Central bank digital currency is the most dangerous totalitarian um, mm. social credit. Yeah. incoming system. I think it's going to be pretty hard to avoid. That's what I think. But I think what we what will happen is we'll have parallel cultures. So you'll transact in other ways with other people. Because, you know, once you've hit your social credit limit for saving You might have to go back to barter. <laughs> yeah, saving your blanc, you know, and yeah. ribeye. Yeah. You, you're going to have to go, mate, oh, God, some of this, I'll lobby one of those. And yeah. be, I think there'll be multiple yeah. digital currency. Because, again, you know, nature does a bore a vacuum. And the, the idea of... You know, Elon Musk said it really well the other day. He said, you know, you want competing societies mm. and structures because, you know, one of them's going to fall apart while another one is doing well and vice versa. So if you have one world central go uh, central government and the whole thing goes to crap, what's it going to be replaced with? So he's right. But 
I'd, you know, localism, I think it's going to be important. I, I think the opposite the, of globalism. Yeah, yeah, I think people will, and I think, you know, like, my family, without wishing to sort of betray their confidence in, it in any way, you know, we're, we're, all much, we're all much tighter than we used to be in a way. You know, I think families get tighter, groups of friends get a lot tighter, you know, and we, and, you know, we, we, we trade intellectual property as well as, as physical property, you know, but yeah, I, I, once that's in, it's game over the minute the CBDC is coming in. And then also, not only is it going to be game over because it, of all the obvious reasons, like we can just stop you doing anything we, you want because you pissed off the government, it's also going to be designed by the government. So it'll be crap anyway. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But actually, once you drive people's income down to the lowest you can possibly do, which they're doing through all of their policies at the moment, conspiracy theory or not, this is what they're doing, people are going to be begging for them. They'll be begging for a central bank digital currency. Mm. That's and that's what they'll. That's how they're just becoming the crack dealers, aren't they? They are. <laughs> they are. This scares the out of me. Me man. too, man. I don't even like. It, 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 it made me sad to listen to you saying we're probably already too far gone. Because I'm, I, I like to be the eternal optimist and think you can also always do something about it. And you know, we need more rebels with a cause. Buying some gold having some watches, some physical tradable assets, skilling up on some things that are useful in a dystopian society. There are still things we can do, surely. Yeah, and also when I say I think it's probably too late, I mean that it, it, we are at the precipice because this is the last generation, our generation, that cares about this stuff and who doesn't want mummy state to look after us. We are the last generation who doesn't want free stuff. Uh, every time I poll anybody about this stuff, it always comes out the same, that they want the state to be in their lives. They want the state to, to, to lean on the state. They don't want to take any individual responsibility for stuff. They want socialism. That's what they want. So if we don't, but what our generation, this is why I want to, this is why, you know, hopefully we'll get a bank account next week and we can start. <laughs> And we can start making some changes because, you know, people need something to actually vote for. And then if you can frighten off a political party in a way, then that would be good. If mm. you can frighten off Rishi. But, you know, look at Rishi. We, <laughs> we don't even have an elected prime minister. No. Well, we haven't. The, here's the irony. We didn't vote for Liz Truss, mm. who beat Rishi. And then we didn't vote for Rishi, who lost to Liz Truss. I oh, know. I mean... That's what I mean by the fact that once you see it, you can't unsee no. it. It's, it is just absolutely bonkers. But, you know, I think there is, there's things that can be done. We made a lot of noise over the police down in Hampshire. We got them, we got the chief constable sacked for uh, chasing after this bloke for reposting a meme I put up on the internet. You know, you can, you can if you go and get in their face a bit, it's, they don't like it. Yeah. So it is possible. Mm. I, but unless people do wake up to what's happening then yeah it'll be too late mm. and it often does you know look let's look back through history it's it when people look back these the people that were shouting going guys this is a major problem often is a bit late by the time everyone gets it right so <laughs> let's hope not let's hope not this time but england to be fair has done you know we've overturned a revolution with cromwell and that lot so since magna carta We've been we've we've kind of had a system that's gone on for a thousand years. So hopefully, as the world the the West begins to self implode, eyes will fall on Britain and go, "How did you guys stop this happening last time?" And hopefully, we can come up with some answers. Mm. Mm. Why did you run for London Mayor? <laughs> for just to see what it was like. I oh, really just as an experiment. Well, no, I did it because I wanted to know. A, I want I don't like Sadiq Khan and um, it was in the middle of lockdowns and I was like, this is ridiculous. And B, I thought, you've got to, you're, you've got to run for something. But the, when I said I was going to do it to the, the guys, <laughs> the PR guys I had at the time, um, who I've gone through a lot of PR guys, I know, I know I've no PR guys. Do they sack you? <laughs> no, it's, well, no, they, some of them try and mould me right. into being like more statesman-like and more, you know, like, follow me, I will lead you to the light. And I'm just like, no, sorry, I'm not interested. I didn't get into this to be in charge of anybody. I got into this because I was forced into this and I want to enable other people to be in charge of themselves. Um, and B, but I sat down with them and they went, you get 2%, mate. 
And I went, no, I won't. It's, it's locked down. We're you get 2%. He said, you'll get 2%, mate. And I was like, no, of the vote. Right. <laughs> and I was like, no, there's got to be people that hate lockdowns. They're going to come out in their millions. I march with them every weekend. But yeah, got 2%. What do you think about Harry and Meghan? <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel really sorry for them. I feel really, really sorry for them. I feel sorry for him, particularly. Um, I've always felt sorry for them. I In think, what regard? Uh, I just, having that worldview must be really unpleasant that you're a victim all the time of somebody else's oppression and hatred of you. Um, but you know, Megan's obviously a very ambitious woman. I think we'll probably, they'll probably be, what have we got? We've got now 2024, 2028. She, she, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't a presidential campaign for Meghan for 2032 in the States. I you think, think that, this is a plan? Oh, I think that's where she's heading. Really? Yeah. And I don't imagine there'll be a great amount of room for Harry in that situation. Harry strikes me as, you know, you can, it's like with, with your mates, you know, when they get a, or a dodgy boyfriend or girlfriend. They go from being someone that you kind of recognise and understand to being someone you just don't recognise and understand at all. And it's usually a, a result of heavy appeasement of the other person, isn't it? You know, and that makes people miserable. Again, what's repressed, suppressed, must express. Mm. And I, you know, I just, I, I, I just, I imagine they're lonely. I, they strike me as two very lonely people. Like, you know, you've got George Clooney at your wedding, but where's your sister? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, so, and I met a lot of Megans in show business, a lot of them. Define a Megan in show business. Narcissistic, um, you know, self-obsessed, really highly um, the opposite of what they say, talk a lot about empathy and kindness while displaying none. Um, very keen to have people cancel out. She's got a very powerful cancel button, doesn't she, Megan? Oh, she um, got Piers Morgan done, didn't she? She got Piers done, she got Jeremy Clarkson done. Mm. Um, got me done, in a way. I mean, not that she would have known who I was at that juncture, but... Uh, how, how did that happen? Well, because I was talking about Meghan and Harry, right, <laughs> wasn't yeah. I, um, yeah. on Question Time. Uh, yeah, no, I, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for him, I imagine he's probably... Uh, you know, what's his book? He's done a book, hasn't he? That spare mm. book. And Meghan, for once, vanished. For once, she wasn't sort of in the papers, sort of complaining about something. And you thought, why aren't you backing up your husband? He's just releasing his best-selling, fastest-selling book of all time. And because she sat there going, why is it? Why are they talking about him? He should be talking about me. I'm Megan. So yeah, I don't envy them. And I and I find it I, I find it pathetic watching them sitting down and talking to another billionaire um, in a billionaire's house okay. about yeah about how poor and oppressed they are. I'm just like, I'll bog off, honestly. So I sort of, yeah, I feel, yeah, I actually do, I, I feel, I'm trying to work out the difference between the meanings of the words sympathy and empathy. And I know that everyone goes, empathy is really good, but I'm, I kind of like sympathy. I'm a bit like, I just feel sorry for you. Mm. I don't, I don't want to put myself in your place. I don't understand your suffering. I just feel sorry for you because I don't think you're, I don't, your life looks miserable to me. It doesn't look happy. No. No, my wife um, regularly says to me that she thinks to be born into the royal family would be one of the greatest curses yeah. that could be bestowed on upon, a, upon a person. And you know, I look at Harry and sometimes think how he's been subjected to you know, a lot of the um, hounding of the media. I could see why he would replay the fact that it could happen to him with it as he perceives happening to his yeah. mum. I just remember when him and um, William were having to walk behind the hearse of their mum in front of the nation. How can you not feel sorry for someone like that? How times have changed, though. So we'd never do that now, would we? I mean, that's just abuse, as far as I'm concerned. That's abuse. Oh, yeah, the royal family. It's a real tricky one, the royal family, as well, because, you know, what's going to... The, once they started, they're desperately trying to go a bit woke, aren't they, as well, so that when they do their little trip to the Commonwealth and they fly over to Jamaica or somewhere like that, they don't get booed. So, you know, and, is, and if, if there is an example of um, white privilege, uh, according to the woke lot, oh, the royal family are yeah. really not scoring good points on that one, are they? No, and this is something that gets in my head, because, I mean, imagine being the queen and having all your family around you basically try and destroy everything that you're about, yet 
what a composed and strong and, for me, from the outside, decent human being. Stoical. Yeah. Good quality. There are not, they're not many stoic leaders left, no. are there, like that? No. Well, it's not celebrated. So, you know, I, I, people, it's like, I, I, had to, I did an interview with this woman the other day and um, for, for the GB News thing, and she decided that she was just going to launch a vicious personal attack on me, which involves calling my mother a coward, my dead mother, recently dead mother, a coward. And wow. it was just like, I was so shocked. And after about 15 minutes of it, I had to stop and I stood up and I was shaking with upsetness. I had no one had made me that upset for ages. And I just turned around and went, I'm a human being. Like, you forget that I'm also a human being in your search for moral probity and purity. You forget that the person you're disagreeing with is also a human being. And that's a massive, massive problem. So, so you know, the stuff that I stand up for, which is be courageous, don't give in, don't, and I teach my kids it as well, good, and because they're going to have a fight of their lives ahead of them mm. because this stuff's not going to get any better soon. Um, we're seen as, you know, in some way invulnerable. We don't have hearts and feelings and sensitivities either. And it's like, well, we really do. We just don't agree with everything you say, mate. Mm. That's it. Yeah. So she was a great leader and we need more stoic leaders. I and mean, also we need more leaders generally rather than more f followers, but mm. actual leaders rather than people who want to be leaders because they, you know, want power. Mm. See, that's the problem. A real leader doesn't want to be in charge of anything. Yeah. And that's, that's tricky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I suppose in politics you've got, um, Nigel Farage says to me, there are, those that, there are those that want to be something and those that want to do something. Yeah. And he said, we've all got all these people who want to be something or someone, a careerist politician, and very few people who actually want to do something for the good of change. And um, yeah, maybe we need more doers than well, beers. Yeah. What it's do you think about that? I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. Um, it's also look at what he's received for that philosophy. You know, and, he's, and look at what he's achieved. Yeah. And look at how, I mean, I don't understand how the man wakes up every morning. Why? Just because of how painful. I mean, look, I've done three years of it and I'm getting a bit inured to. Um, it, what's it? Three years of? Doing it. What is doing it? Well, mean? doing it is trying to, trying to change certain things that really bother me. In, in, in politics, you mean? In politics, in culture, in, yeah. you know, things that affect me. Standing up for things yeah. which you know receive you get beaten down and I find I find it tiring so the man did it for a quarter of a century yeah it's like you must be knackered mate <laughs> yeah, yeah. well I've met a lot of very famous people and spent time with a lot of very famous people and I have never walked 500 yards with someone who is more famous than Nigel Farage I've walked 500 yards with a lot of famous people and he got stopped every five milliseconds. Yeah. And you know what, Most more support. Yeah, I get a lot of more people, when I get stopped on the street, I get a lot more love than I do hate. Mm. And, um, but I suppose there is the element of people who don't like you are just gonna walk past and say something 20 yards down the road. Like, yeah, maybe. Or whatever, yeah. you know, but it's, I, yeah, when people stop me, they're nice, mm. mostly. Do you ever sometimes think, I should have taken the easy road <laughs> <laughs> and, been, you know, gone up the corporate ladder and no regrets? No, who wants to? I don't want to live that life. I, you know, I want to, I want to look back on my life and go, oh. I want to be, I, I want to be heading towards the long sleep going, um, mate, you didn't, yeah, you wasted a few days on the Xbox, but, <laughs> you know, you, you, you stood up for something. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, you know, I, I want my, I do want my kids to have an example of, you know, my, I feel really sorry for my kids, actually. No, I don't actually, I feel, I, it's, that's a different feeling. I feel very protective of them. But, you know, I imagine they get a bit of grief because um, my youngest son goes to the wokest school on earth. So, uh, I mean... Is that your choice? No. The pe uh, well, it's <laughs> another story. Um, the, Sounds like a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm parked in your building, so... The, the, the parents, the wave of parents part as I walk into that school. Except this lovely um, black dad who goes, all right, racist! <laughs> and he comes over and gives me a massive hug and um, we have a good giggle. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, when I, we did a documentary about 
uh, PSHE and RSE called Groomed about what they teach kids in schools in these PSHE lessons and these RSE lessons. And yeah. I, I put it in their parents' WhatsApp group. <laughs> because they're all political in this WhatsApp group. Yeah. You know, I'm, it's all, and I'm doing a bake sale for Ukraine and it's all full of Ukraine flags and Slava Ukraini and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's not like they're not political. It's not just like Johnny's got football at 10. So I thought, okay, well, if we're going to do that, I'll put that in. Whoa. The response was interesting to that. So I was like, I think I left after. I, I can't remember if I left after or before I was called the homophobic fascist. What, well, left the WhatsApp group? Yeah. <laughs> Just your number left yeah. in the bomb. Lawrence Fox left. Yeah. Um, so, that, yeah. It, does that not make you feel like going to a school and knowing that people are looking at you and thinking those things, does that not make you feel awkward? No, because that's what earpods are for. Right. You know, if you're feeling yeah. vulnerable that day, because listen, we all have bad days, don't we? Yeah. So if I'm feeling a bit vulnerable that day or I've been attacked a lot, the earpods go in and I'll have an imaginary conversation with someone. Right. But most of the time I like to walk in and smile and give them the, hello, how are you? Lovely yeah. to see you. Because I genuinely care about them. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not judging them just because they're, you know, 50 years old and still wearing high tops, you know, and, Kind of we're nearly there. I know, but we're 44. Yeah, that's true. And also, I've owned these shoes since I was probably 25. They're weathering well. I yeah. only got into high tops about two years ago. Well, I like those. Thank you. I wouldn't like to be kicked in the face by them. <laughs> I do <don't> have a free. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's my midlife crisis. Well, we're all having a midlife crisis. Well, we should. Uh, what, is there such thing as a midlife crisis? Because they do talk about midlife crisis. I wonder, my dad, you see, he gave up acting. He was a bit younger than I was. He gave up acting to become a um, missionary. And um, I gave up acting or was kicked out still, as I was saying earlier, can't quite work out yeah. which way. Who right? dumped who? <laughs> who dumped yeah. who? Um, it was, you know, maybe that, maybe it is a midlife crisis or a midlife awakening. Who knows what it yeah. is? But certainly our emotions change, don't they? Our values, the things that matter to us change as we mm. get older as men. I used to ride motorbikes like I didn't care whether I lived or died. Yeah, Harry. And um, I like, you know, in racing around tracks and stuff, and yeah. I didn't care. I was just like, I want to go faster. I don't care about anything. And now the thought of getting on, I mean, my bike got nicked by some mm. So I don't have, and I didn't replace it. But the thought of getting on a R1 again, mm. I'm like, what? What do you mean? No. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned masculinity. I'd love to have a quick chat about that because I, in a way I'm really relieved. I'm not 14 years old in society because I would be so f confused. I was confused anyway yeah. <laughs> growing up um, because, you know, being a man is confusing just like it is being a woman. But, but masculinity seems to be such under attack. And if you're a, a real man, it's toxic masculinity. And you've got all these people like Andrew Tate on the one extreme who seems to be representing that strong ideology of a... Um, traditional man and of course seeing Jordan Peterson ball his eyes out every five minutes and we've got so much about masculinity going on in the world what's your view on where masculinity is um, I think it's we got first of all we've got to break it down to the fact that men and women are different creatures and we'll never ever understand what is going on in the side of a woman's head ever so just get that one out and of the maybe way. vice versa and maybe vice versa so that's what I would say. Uh, I think masculinity is crucial because um, at the end of the day, without men, women can't reproduce, the species can't go on, and without men, you wouldn't get the power lines fixed or sewage systems built, firefighters. Soldiers. And men kill themselves in much greater numbers than women do. Uh, so I don't like the idea of, it's again, it's this woke thing about putting two words together that contradict each other or they modify this endless need for modifiers in language like toxic masculinity there's no, no masculinity is just masculinity there's good examples of it and there are bad examples of it but the main one is a desire to protect i don't know do you have kids mm -hmm. so until you have kids you don't have that sense of protection you just don't know but you would do anything to protect your kids if you could be the big, most quiet, gentle, non-violent person, and someone could go up to your kids and you would rip that person's throat out, whoever you were. And that's, a, that's I think a woman would probably do the same, but it's a sort of, it's a, there's, a, there's a visceral protection in men. There's also a protection of women, 
that comes with men. Now, I think as the as the, the sexual dynamic has changed and women have been, you know, cleverly uh, shunted into the workplace and being told that being a mother is the most pathetic, embarrassing thing you can possibly be in life, um, the dynamic has changed and women now sort of a lot of a lot of this iteration of feminism is about copying men and it becomes it actually can be quite toxic in a feminine aspect of it so i think being a, a man is being there is raising your kids showing them what the boundaries are of life you know the uncomfortable stuff that women don't necessarily do you know my my kid's mum is very loving and she's really you know she's great with them but my, my kids work out where the red line is with me and I think that's a really good lesson to teach a kid. Mm. And as you see with what's going on with fatherlessness across the West anyway, you know, look what happens to kids who don't have dads. What happens? They're, well, in America, where they do have a lot of the stats on this stuff, it's horrendous, isn't it, in terms of fatherlessness, in, in terms of criminal outcomes for children and young men who mm. weren't raised by dads and stuff like that. And the same here. You know, it's, you, it's the worst outcome you can have to not have a present dad, pretty much. Wow. It's a really, really bad thing. I mean, ideally, you want mum and a dad, but it often, you know, we live in the modern world. People have many epochs of their lives where they decide, you know, I want to do something else with it. But there's a reason why all of that stuff was set up, mm. that kids thrive best in, a, in an environment with, with, those, with the two sexes sort of applying their own equal but differently expressed pressure on a child to help that child equip for that child for its life as it moves forward. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, it's hard to define what masculinity is because it's hard to separate it out from individuality. And also, I'm much more interested in individuality than I am in any form of like descriptor for people. And I don't like putting people in groups, no. particularly. No, but that leads me on to we've got like a random round. Okay. And I'm just going to ask it as it is. We've sort of covered it, but I'm just going to ask it as it is. Um, how many genders are there? There are no genders. No genders? No. Why are there no genders? Because it, it's, I mean, the, okay, there's genders in, uh, well, I mean, it, if you're speaking French, then fine, you know, you've got, but that, it's like, you know, je me suis levé tout till it, You're that. talking about le and la. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to, that's, that would, that's a gender in language, but, yeah. I mean, in terms of life, no, it's temperament and personality, but there's no gender, no such thing. Sex, you're male or a female. Genders. Okay, so how many sexes are there? Two, and then Two. A, a very, very small number of people right in the middle who have, you know, chromosomal abnormalities that lead them to be, you know, slightly more of one and slightly more of another. Yeah. You know, in the intersex world, but the overwhelming majo majority, beyond even, you know, quantifying as male and female. Mm. Do you think society embraces individualism at the moment? No, it's terrified of it. Why? Um, because we, you know, it's again, it's a, it's a multitude of things. But one of the main problems, I think, is social media, digital recording. You know, they said that uh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was something like twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen that more photos were taken in twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen than were taken in the entire history of photography to that date. So the fact that we can record each other and ourselves, and um, and it's permanent, has given people pause for call, uh, cause to pause in terms of their expressing of their own individuality because they don't want to maybe step on a landmine that is left for them. You know, you, I, I stood on a landmine by pointing out that England maybe wasn't a racist country. Uh, there are many landmines you can step on. So individuality is has been suppressed. And I think the digital, uh, you know, the crack pipe that is our phone doesn't help. Um, I think the fact that people record, you know, if, if you get into it, like when I get into any form of discussion with somebody, I will be, the first thing I'm thinking is who's recording this, mm. you know? So it, that encourages you to, you are part of a, a mutually approved surveillance state. So I don't think that helps either. Mm. So, yeah, that you know. scares the shit out of me, all that. Yeah, I mean, I've not been done by it because I tend to just say what I think mm. all the time, and that is my defence mechanism against it. But, um, you know, I'm sure at some point someone will record something somewhere of me saying something that I regret. Mm. You know, people don't want to 
regret things. You know, right. people want to go, no, I'm good, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. And we're constantly affirming the fact that we're all good people as well, which is a terrible, really bad idea. Why? Start from the position if you're an absolute <laughs> and you want to be a good person. That's the people I respect, you know? It's like, you're not a very good, I mean, I don't know what goes on in the inside of your head, but sometimes if someone really pisses me off, I'm like, I, I want to chin you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I had it the other day. I, took, I was out with two girls. I was out with two girls oh, in a bar, and, w and they're both quite outspoken, right? And um, someone recognised me, and one of the girls decided that they would defend me in a quite a, you know, she's, she's a ballsy girl. Is that, am I allowed? <laughs> Cancel! <laughs> and, um, and then this guy comes up to me and he start, slightly gets in my face. And I stood up to I stood up and I said, I, I don't really know what to say to you, but unless you move away from me but a distance of yards, I'm gonna headbutt you. <laughs> it's gonna happen. And then the girls were like sort of I was like going, they're like, we need to stay for another drink, and I'm like, no, I need to get out of here, otherwise I'm gonna be arrested at some point. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what that's got anything to do with, but Well, I think you started by saying fundamentally you know, we're all bastards. Yeah, fundamentally we're not particularly good people. A lot of our desires are greed, you know, look at the way people treat each other in the world. I mean, it's, not, it's not a litany of brilliance, is it? So th this modern religion of going, no, actually I'm a really good person. And I'm like, you're not. Because y I'm a human being too, and I know that there's lots of nasty stuff that goes on the inside of my head, and I know there's lots of nasty stuff that goes on the inside of your head, and actually the people, that, the people who I trust the least are the people that say that they're good people. Mm. I like people to go, we're all capable of horrible nastiness, let's start from that position and mm. really work and be accountable to each other, not to be mm. Mm. So let's do this random round then. Okay. All right. Um, one million engaged followers on social media or one million cash in the hand and why? Um, one million engaged followers on social media because you can affect uh, people's thinking and reach out to them, give them confidence to be themselves, and a million quid is a, money's a social construct. You know, if if you if you're hunting money your whole life, you'll never find it. It finds you. What's more evil, the extreme far left or the extreme far right, and why? They're just as bad as each other. Extremes of anything are, are dreadful. And the, you know they're, they're as contemptible as each other, and they fortunately cancel each other out in time. How much would you need to be paid to vote Labour? Um, at the moment, nothing. Um, I, you know, I, I, if I don't get a chance to vote for myself, I, it looks like I'm going to. Um, it looks like I probably will vote Labour. I, I would certainly wouldn't be voting Conservative at, at any point at the moment. And you know. Keir Starmer, whether, whether you disagree with what he's got to say and all that stuff, he's got a plan. It may not be a plan I like, but I, I'd prefer to vote for someone with a plan than vote for someone who just doesn't want to rock the boat too much. Best leader, um, Joe Biden or Boris Johnson? Oh, God. Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, well, I mean, Joe Biden's not really a leader, is he? He's just a puppet of the former regime of the Obama regime, you know, the progressive regime. So he's just sort of dangled by Barack and Michelle, who just tell him what to do, and the squad who's trying to bring in all that crap. Uh, Boris, uh, yeah, Boris probably, you know. I mean, uh, he's not a man I've ever, I've, I've always thought he'd be good fun to have a pint with. But, um, and you know, he's got some nice, he used to have some nice libertarian values until he decided to um, make love to his chief advisor who's a turtle saver, you know. So, I don't know, again, it's an, it's an example of, you know, picking your partner well, because he, Boris seemed to go a bit, lean a bit woke once he got in with Carrie Servitism. Sorry, Carrie, I shouldn't be mean about her. <laughs> but at least I can't be accused of being a racist like I was with Meghan, because Carrie's as white as they come, isn't she? <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> right. What are you optimistic about? Let's leave this on a really nice note, if we can. There still must be some hope for society and humanity. What are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic that more and more people are seeing it for what it is. Certainly, the, I think that people are, people are really beginning to question the narrative 
in a way that they maybe haven't. And also there's the tools to express that um, awakening that they have. So I'm really optimistic that people are starting to wake up to the climate scam and they're going to go, you know what, I'm not going to be immiserated so that everyone from Islington can feel good about themselves. And I think people are going to really resist that. I'm optimistic that um, we, c we, we have an open, uh, Elon Musk has managed to open up social media so people can actually you know, use it as a, a place for free speech. I imagine what he will do is he'll turn around and say to YouTube, I want to buy you. Or if they don't sell it to him, he'll just turn Twitter into a YouTube, which will create more content, more access to, for people to meet. I'm optimistic about the fact that you'll, we now have access to public intellectuals and great thinkers that we never had before. The Shelby Steeles and the Thomas Souls and the Jordan Petersons and the Dave Rubins and you know the Daily Wire crowd who do so well and all of that. I'm optimistic that people have are using their their the time that they would be spent not doing anything listening to podcasts and listening to other people and 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 either agreeing or disagreeing with them or taking something from it or not. And I'm optimistic that that by the very nature of itself is a reemergence of the individual because you choose what goes in the recipe nowadays. And this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you, Lawrence? Disruption is the is crucial part of every epoch and every generation. Within every generation, you need the conformers and you need the disruptors. And w the conformers are asking you to lean in one direction, and the disruptors are asking you to lean in another. But disruption I always associate with fun, humor, controversial, is that a word? <laughs> uh, and you know, it, it, it's a crucial part of society. It's it's without a disruptor, you don't. You all you've got is a is a monochromatic, black and white world where nothing happens. Mm. Disruptors come in and shake it up a bit. Disruptor is the first person on the dance floor in a, at a wedding. Mm. Well, it's been great. Thank yeah, you thank guys. you, Lawrence. Really Pleasure. appreciate that. Wow, I don't even know where to start on that conversation. I would love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you thought of Lawrence Fox and that deep rabbit hole conversation. So if, like us, you want honesty, balance, integrity in media, fight back. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.